Happy Tuesday, Dog Nation. My name is Brandon Adams, and this is Dog Nation Daily, the daily podcast for Georgia Bulldogs fans, presented today by Engineered Solutions of Georgia. Good to have you with us for what you think is going to be a fun show. A little bit different for regular listeners slash viewers of the program. You typically come to expect Mike Griffith on Wednesdays. Today, Mike makes his appearance on Tuesday. So a little different schedule on that, but same great content as you've come to expect. So we'll hear from Mike Griffith here coming up in just a couple of minutes. We'll also talk about the continued fallout from the laughable accusations thrown out there by Valdosta High School coach Rush Probes, who didn't know he was being recorded, I don't believe, who uh, just said what he said. But we kind of mocked this yesterday. I think we're validated in doing so. We'll talk more about that on today's program. Really fun take on Darnell Washington off the very top today. We'll have some fun with that. Pretty good appearance by Sam Pittman on On the Beat uh, a couple of days ago. So we're busy. We'll cover it all. And as I said, Mike Griffith, special appearance here on this Tuesday as well. So what do you say we get it going? Dog Nation Daily, daily podcast for Georgia Bulldogs fans, presented by Engineered Solutions of Georgia, begins right now. Today's episode of Dog Nation Daily is brought to you by Engineered Solutions of Georgia. Dial 678-ESOG now for a solution to your foundation and waterproofing problems. Presented by DogNation.com, this is Dog Nation Daily, the daily podcast for Georgia Bulldogs fans. Here's your host, Brandon Adams. We had a hearty laugh yesterday at the non-Georgia fans, SEC folks, who were just hoping and praying that the uh, accusations that Rush Probst, the Valdosta High School coach, was recorded making would somehow stick to Georgia and be a problem for UGA. We said this was no big thing. It would essentially disintegrate before our very eyes. I think today we have more evidence. That's exactly where all of this is heading. We will get to that here coming up in just a moment on Dog Nation Daily, presented by Engineered Solutions of Georgia today. By the way, great to have you with us. Let me begin, though, with this, something on the field. I think this kind of stuff is fun. The other day, uh, Brad Crawford, writer for 24-7 Sports, was looking at what he thinks is the rising star for each and every SEC team for the upcoming season. And for Georgia, the name that gets mentioned is the tight end, Darnell Washington. This is what Crawford writes about Washington on the pages of 247sports.com. Uh, he says that given JT Daniels' return at quarterback and the Bulldogs expected assault through the air, boy, doesn't that sound good. Wouldn't that be a fun thing to think about, an assault through the air for the upcoming season? Uh, he says Washington's numbers should flourish uh, this fall alongside George Pickens and several other pass-catching weapons in Athens. 24-7 Sports goes on to say Darnell Washington only recorded seven catches for 166 yards last season, but much of that total came when Daniels was inserted in into the starting lineup. Washington started seven games at tight end and will be seasoned in his role this fall. Uh, they go on to say 24-7 does expect Darnell Washington to be one of the league's best in his position if Daniels is the Heisman candidate that he's been advertised to be. Now, how good will JT Daniels be? We'll wait and see on that. Obviously, the sky is potentially the limit on that. But I certainly agree that this is potentially a big season for Darnell Washington to come into his own. You certainly saw a glimpse of that over the course of the end of the 2020 season. And you'll acknowledge the obvious, I mean, just to the naked eye, it's clear that Darnell Washington possesses a skill set and some kind of God-given physical attributes that most football players just don't have. You know, you see Darnell going through pregame warm-up, something like that, in addition to the fact that he wears the zero, which is a little bit of an uncommon number. Uh, he just looks kind of an uncommon body type. He's tall, he's big, but he's well put together. The entire package looks really, really impressive. And, you know, frankly, you know, in a show like this, we're admittedly, we don't make any apologies for the fact that we also wanted Georgia to get a Rick Gilbert, another former five-star tight end from the class of 2020. But the fact that we've paid some attention to uh, Gilbert along the way with his recruitment, especially after he decommitted from Florida, certainly should not obscure from the fact that Georgia already has a pretty phenomenal prospect at tight end and a, a guy that really could, to use the word that Brad Crawford from 24-7 Sports used, flourish, probably a fancier word than someone like me should be using. But I, I do think that Darnell Washington has a chance to flourish here, here this year and really take a big, bold step forward here during his sophomore season. Because, I mean, let's face it, as the writer said for 24-7 Sports, there were those moments in the latter stage of the season once JT Daniels was inserted as Georgia quarterback where we clearly saw a different version of Darnell Washington 
that we had seen earlier in the season. Part of that, I believe, is because Washington, over the course of his freshman year, like a lot of freshmen do, was himself becoming more seasoned, but also because he just had a very capable quarterback delivering the football. We saw evidence of this in the Peach Bowl, winning against Cincinnati, the regular season finale, what turned out to be the regular season finale uh, against Missouri. In fact, after that game, Kirby Smart, when asked about the way that Washington played, including a big play for Georgia in that game, was very quick to throw some praise Darnell's way, maybe echoing what 24-7 Sports thinks that it notices right now. This is Kirby Smart after the Missouri game. Darnell's been a weapon all year. It's been, it's been us trying to find ways to use him. I mean, he, he has a unique combination of size, and he's a hard, he's, you know, he's a tough matchup. And if you can mismatch people and, you know, have ability to run the ball, but then also flex them out and throw the ball, it's really frustrating. You know, if you go back to that play, the, the corner went over. The safety had to play Darnell, and he's saying, "Wait a second, now I got a, I got a, I got a Darnell on a safety, and those guys don't cover for a living." So there's a lot that Smart says there that's really interesting. There's one word in particular that Smart uses that I think is becoming more in common around college football, especially for guys who play a version of the tight end position the way that Darnell Washington does. Kirby says, hey, you can flex this guy. In other words, you can treat him like a regular tight end or you can treat him like something a little bit different. As Smart says, when you get these guys matched up on safeties who don't cover solely on every single play you know, throughout the entirety of a game, especially against someone who has the athletic credentials of maybe what Darnell Washington brings to the table, all of a sudden that gives you some potential mismatches to exploit. And I think that's really fascinating. And it's one of the reasons why I'm glad that Georgia has a guy like Todd Munkin employed as offensive coordinator, because I think he has a real ability to exploit a lot of this kind of stuff in a way that maybe some offensive coordinators might be able to, might not be able to. Munkin's got the, you know, the acumen to be able to do it, but he's also got the talent at his disposal to kind of go out there and, and do some really fun things. And let me make a comparison here for a moment. And I want to be really careful here that you hear what I'm saying, but you don't hear what I'm not saying. I'm not about to tell you that Darnell Washington is about to become as valuable for Georgia as Kyle Pitts was for Florida. I'm not, I'm not saying that. But when you hear the way in which people talk about Kyle Pitts, as good as he was for the Gators uh, this past season, I do think you get a sense for how valuable a great tight end can be when he is used creatively at the kind of utmost of his abilities. And, and that may be what Darnell Washington has a chance to provide for Georgia. Will he match the numbers that that uh, Kyle Pitts put up for Florida? Who knows about that? That has to be, you know, that that remains to be seen. But can Todd Munkin use him creatively the way that Florida was very successfully used Kyle Pitts? I think that's a really interesting thing to watch for this upcoming season. And as, as a fact, as a way of kind of bolstering this comment, let me go back to Sports Center from a little earlier this week. Uh, Scott Van Pelt, the host of the show, interviewing Todd McShay, the ESPN NFL draft analyst. McShay now has Pitts, the former Florida tight end, going number six overall in the upcoming NFL draft. McShay, in his view, Pitts is flying up the draft boards right now, which is maybe interesting to you, maybe not. But I want you to listen to the way in which uh, Van Pelt describes Pitts, the way in which McShay describes Pitts, and think about this as a potential template for how a tight end could also be used in the Georgia offense here as well. This from ESPN a couple of days ago. The first pass catcher you have off the board is Kyle Pitts out of Florida, who was a monster. Now, it says T.E. next to his name, but like, Help our viewers that might not have seen him understand. Like, he's not a traditional tight end, like, hand-in-the-dirt blocker. Like, what is this guy? He's a matchup piece. You can move him all around, Scott, and that's what I love about him is you can play him out wide, you can play him in the slot, and the thing that I've really grown to appreciate about him, he's not a great blocker, but he can do it functionally in line, and he gives good effort, and he will get down the field, and he'll fight and try to finish as a – as a sustainer when trying to block. So I think Pitts is going to wind up being around 250, 255 pounds. And again, can play inside, can play outside. You can work him in the screen game and he can really create after the catch. So listen to what you heard there. Hey, this is a non-traditional type tight end. This is a guy that you can look for matchups to exploit with. Not the greatest blocker, but functional enough that he can still be a weapon in the run game. The truth is, Darnell Washington's probably a little bit better blocker, at least at this stage of his college career, than what was just described there for Kyle Pitts. But the kind of guy that you can use in the screen game, that you can use as a slot receiver, that you can do all kinds of stuff with. I mean, that is the template for what athletic tight ends can be here in the modern college game. And I think Darnell Washington has a chance to be that. Listen, matching the stats that Kyle Pitts has put up at Florida, that's a really hard thing to do. There's a chance that Pitts ends up 
you know, we look back on his career and he you know, was truly a special tight end, as good as any tight end that's come around in recent years. I'm not saying the stats are going to match, but the creativity in which the way that Pitts has been used, maybe that is matched. And maybe when you think about the real weapons for Georgia on the field for this upcoming season, maybe Darnell Washington is one of those weapons that ought to be pretty prominent in your mind here. With that said, let me shift gears, talk about something completely different here for a moment. We told you this off the top of the program that we thought the uh, Rush Probes allegations were silly when they first came down. We thought the way in which Probes was kind of caught on, you know, audio describing all this kind of stuff was way too theatric to be true. And in retrospect, I think our initial opinion on this is kind of bearing itself bearing itself out to be true. Been a lot of response to the audio that you heard on our show yesterday. Most prominently is this. Nick Chubb, Cleveland Browns running back, former Georgia running back, the guy that Probe said got a bunch of money to return to Georgia in his senior season back in 2017, was very clear about this on social media yesterday. Let me show you the tweet from Chubb here, or as Probes called him yesterday, Chubbs, uh, mispronouncing his name as well as slandering him. Nick Chubb says on Twitter, if I needed money, <laughs> I would have gone pro to begin with. Uh, he says, hashtag fake news. I like that for Nick Chubb coming after probes like the IRS, uh, really letting it be known that, uh, no, listen, I didn't take money at Georgia, uh, making that very clear. I don't think there's a whole lot of ways to, uh, to really interpret that other than a very strong denial from Chubb. You have our buddy Chip Towers, the AJC, has also talked to the other person on the other side of that recording who really disparaged Propes and all of that, essentially saying that, that Propes was trying to use these wild, you know, tall tales of what's going on around college football to basically extort money from the Valdosta uh, you know, Booster Club, things like that. So he had nothing good to say about Propes. And Hugh Nall, the the former Georgia player, former Auburn assistant coach, by the way, who Probst also mentioned by name. He was quoted by the Athens Banner Herald denying all of this, saying that he's already been in contact with Georgia's, uh, what do you call it, the, the you know, the, you know, basically the, the, the compliance department. That's the word I'm looking for, the compliance department. So UJ compliance is in on all of this. It's extra work for them. I hate that for them. But in terms of this being the kind of big thing that rival Georgia fans can't wait to hear more about and, and, and can't wait to follow every single, I was even listening to some out of market sports radio and they're talking, about, Ooh, smoke around Georgia. There's going to be fire there. No, I don't believe there's going to be much fire there at all. In fact, I don't think you hear much more from the story after that. It bubbled up. It was interesting. It was entertaining. Rival fans would love for it to be true, but as it, as it turns out, this one's probably going to fizzle out into nothing, much to the chagrin of all the other rival folks who kind of check in on the dogs on a regular basis. My name is Brandon Adams, and this is Dog Nation Daily, daily podcast for Georgia Bulldogs fans, presented today by Engineered Solutions of Georgia. And it's great to have you with us, no matter how you get to us today, live on video 10 a.m., Facebook, YouTube, Twitter. We're on Twitch. We're on the radio at noon on Athens Sports Radio 960 The Ref. We're available as a podcast wherever you find them, including the world-famous dognation.com, the Apple Player, Google Player, Spotify, all of those uh, podcast platforms. You can find Dog Nation Daily on all of those. And our friends at Engineered Solutions of Georgia make it all possible. And in addition to being friends of ours, ESOG, also proud partners of UGA as well. It's always great to do business and support a company that loves supporting UGA. And that's something that Engineered Solutions of Georgia is certainly proud of. And great friends of ours here at Dog Nation Daily as well. When it comes to your foundation and waterproofing issues, we've had a lot of rain as of late. And for you, that means you see that water showing up in places where you don't want it to be basement crawl space sometimes your garage and you also know that some of that kind of unsettled nature when it comes to that can also lead to some of those foundation issues as well or just a completely separate issue when the foundation stuff shows up cracks in your foundations whatever else uh, that's a big thing to be aware of and you probably know that if you've seen evidence of this you could take you should take the step to do something about it Sometimes it's easy to want to put it off, but let me put your mind at ease that it's actually going to be a comforting feeling to reach out to my friends at Engineered Solutions of Georgia because if your issue requires a simple fix, they're going to explain to you what the simple fix is. If it's something more substantial than that, then all the more reason to have smart people doing the work for you. ESOG has two full-time engineers on staff, which makes them really, really important, a great asset for you as you deal with your own foundation waterproofing issues. So please make sure you check them out online. Uh, actually, give them a call. This is a very easy number to remember. Uh, just simply dial 678-ESOG now. 
That number once again, 678-ESOG-NOW. That'll get you in touch with my friends at Engineered Solutions of Georgia, and I can promise you they're going to take really good care of you. Hopefully we'll take good care of your time here on Dog Nation Daily, presented by ESOG today. Coming up in just a couple of minutes' time, we're going to talk to Mike Griffith. A little bit of an unusual appearance for Mike on Tuesday, but we're kind of just shifting things around here just a little bit this week. So Mike going to pop on on a Tuesday today. Our, our buddy Connor Riley from Dog Nation will show up on tomorrow's show. So a little bit of a shifting around just for one week on that. So we'll look forward to hearing from Mike. By the way, speaking of Mike, Mike had a great interview on Friday night, Dog Nation video channels with Arkansas head coach, former UG offensive line coach Sam Pittman. Pittman's a guy that I've always loved. Georgia fans feel the same way. He was very popular during his time at UGA. And a couple stories that Sam Pittman told that I thought were just really terrific. First of all, about the process of what even led him to coming to UGA and the fact that the the, the groundwork for all of this was apparently laid multiple years in advance. This is a very interesting kind of now-it-can-be-told type story of how Pittman ended up at UGA. I find this to be fascinating and a great retelling of this for Pittman, who says he'd actually had affection for UGA for as long as he could remember as a college football fan. Good stuff from Sam Pittman here. I always had a uh, thing for Georgia, always, uh, since Herschel Walker. So... Two years before I went to Georgia, we had played Alabama. And after the game, I'd, I'd never met Kirby, but he had come over and he said, you know, I'm going to get me a head coaching job and I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to make it hard for you not to come with me. I said, well, you better go back and look at the tape. You may not want me after you see see how we played, you know. And he laughed and, and uh, sure enough. And I told my wife, I said, you know, I don't want to leave here, but if Kirby, you know, he's played at Georgia and I said, if anything ever happens at Georgia and he gets that job, I'm going to definitely look at it if he's serious. I think what Pittman says there validates something that I've said before about Kirby Smart. That was pretty obvious that Smart had a plan in place and he hit the ground running with that plan once he was hired as Georgia coach at the end of the 2015 season. And, you know, it, the entirety of the plan didn't work out perfectly. As a, for instance, Kirby initially reached out to Dan Enos as offensive coordinator, who was working with Pittman at the time at Arkansas. Enos's contract wouldn't allow him to leave Arkansas, so the pivot was made to Jim Chaney after that. So there were some small hiccups along the way, but the but the large infrastructure of the plan for Kirby Smart was clearly in place. And you compare that to a, a situation like, say, Josh Heupel at Tennessee now, where, to my eye, it seems like they're just sort of grasping at straws there in Knoxville and trying to kind of make it up as they go along. Obviously, I think plans like that are a lot less likely to be successful over the course of the long haul. You can say what you want about Kirby Smart, and plenty of people do, but the one thing that you cannot deny is is that Smart has had his eye on the ball for what he wants George to be from the very get-go. Now, maybe now we're in a period of evolution related to that, and there's a little bit more influence from offensive guys like Todd Munkin, but the one thing about Smart, he's always been buttoned up, he's always been professional, even two years before taking the Georgia job, talking to Sam Pittman about when I do get hired as a head coach, you're the guy that I want to kind of do all of this around. Your offensive line style is what I want to be the hallmark of that side of the ball for my program. I think that's really interesting from Pittman about Smart. I think the timeline part of this is also interesting, too, of, okay, so they were talking about working together. Two years prior to taking this job, were they talking about working together at Georgia, or was that just Pittman kind of filling in the blanks of maybe it would be UGA, given the fact that Smart played there? That's another part of that from uh, – from Pittman that I find kind of interesting. We'll talk to, about, uh, to Mike Griffith about that here coming up in just a moment. Now, one more from him. And this is the kind of thing that I just kind of enjoy hearing. As a fan who really enjoyed the Pittman era at UGA, it sounds like Pittman really enjoyed that era too, that his football memories as a coach were really pretty phenomenal, according to his own telling of this, based on his time there at Georgia. And for a guy that's an Arkansas guy, I was at Arkansas before coming to UGA, now back at Arkansas in his home state as head coach, to still speak as fondly of Georgia as he does, to me that kind of says something kind of nice about UGA. I, I like this from Pittman as well. Let's hear more of it. And I'll be honest with you, you know, I never had the opportunities in my coaching career to do what we did at Georgia. In other words, I never got to go to the national championship game, never went to the Rose Bowl, never went to the Sugar Bowl. And the fans of Georgia are certainly incredible. And they're not only at home, but it's on the road is where, you know, I'll never forget the Notre Dame game. when we went to Notre Dame and played the year we uh, went to the championship game. And uh, so 
that's kind of how that happened. And, and uh, I had uh, some of the four best years of my life there, there at Georgia working under Kirby and, and learned a lot from him. Listen, I just think that's really nice. I, I, I like hearing about Pittman being as happy as he was at Georgia enjoying that time. As I said before, you know, the same way you want players to come through the Georgia program and leave on the other side as really impressive draft picks. And if they go on to have NFL success, if they do big things in the pro league, then that just makes it easier to get great players to fall in behind them at Georgia. I think the same thing is true with uh, assistant coaches as well. If a guy like Pittman comes to UGA, says these were four of the best years of my life, and by the way, on the other side of this, I got my dream job as Arkansas head coach, I think that speaks pretty well for for the task of being a UGA assistant. That career path that Pittman just traveled, I believe, makes being offensive line coach at Georgia a very attractive thing to be. It was pretty obvious that Matt Luke jumped at the chance to do that once Pittman left, and it's an example of the Georgia football machine kind of working the way that it's supposed to. So I enjoyed hearing from Sam Pittman on On the Beat uh, Monday, or shoot, this past Friday night here on the Dog Nation video channels. Good job by Mike Griffith on all of that. By the way, speaking of Mike Griffith, let's talk to him about the Pittman interview and so much more here, including the fallout from the Rush Probes allegations. Let's do all of that here on Dog Nation Daily, presented by Engineered Solutions of Georgia. And it's great to have all of you with us as well. From Athens and across the SEC or wherever the recruiting trail may lead, here's a DogNation.com insider. Let's say hello to Mike Griffith here. A little bit of an unusual appearance from him. Not normally on Tuesdays here on our program, but good to have him uh, with us nonetheless. And uh, Mike, great job on the interview front here as of late. We'll talk to you about a couple of those that you've conducted here, beginning with some of the audio we just heard a moment ago. Former Georgia offensive line coach Sam Pippen, now head coach at Arkansas. Uh, Mike, it certainly seems like he enjoyed his time at UGA. Special memories for him and really all of us who lived through that, going to Pasadena and everything else. Uh, as a Georgia fan, i got to say it's kind of nice to hear a guy like that, seemingly who enjoyed his time at Georgia as much as he did. What did you make of the interview yourself? Yeah, I mean, it's just one of those deals. Every time you think Sam Pittman can't be any more likable, you, you watch that interview and you listen to Sam and you, just, you understand how he connects with people. You, you understand why parents – want to send their kids to play for Sam Pittman. And, you know, we saw it on the field, Brandon. You know, we, we watched that Arkansas game, and, you know, that's a game I think we all thought was going to be a layup, and Arkansas was beating Georgia at halftime. And that's just, that's all Sam Pittman. That's a level of buy-in. That's a level of coaching. Uh, getting the drop on Georgia. He, he just did a great job with that team. Uh, now, granted, they, they kind of faded at the end. Yeah, they had a tough schedule. You know, they had to play Florida and Georgia from the east, and, of course, they were in the West Division, and, controversial loss against Auburn on a really bad call. Um, and he's got 20 starters coming back next year to 10 seniors. I, I mean, Sam Pittman, uh, in one year as a head coach, uh, he's, he's impressed, and he's certainly impressed here. And he had a really special connection with Georgia that he talked about. I, that was kind of cool when he, when he talked about how much he loved Georgia and he always had a thing for Georgia. I thought that was some really interesting backstory um, that, that could talked to him two years before he hired him and said, I'm going to get a job and I'm, I'm, I'm going to make it hard for you not to work for me. Yeah, I thought that was really interesting, too. We talked about that as well. First of all, it, to me, it speaks to the plan that Smart had in place for when he did get hired as a head coach. And admittedly, part of my curiosity related around this is, and it was difficult to tell from what Pittman said, on the one hand, it almost sounds like the idea of that job being Georgia was at least floated around. Whether that was Pittman just assuming it might be Georgia because Smart was a UG alumnus, or if, if George was actually being talked about by Smart there. Listening closely to Pittman, it does kind of make you wonder when they're on that field talking two years prior to taking uh, the Georgia job, was Kirby Smart talking about being a generic head coach? Or was he already on his eyes on what would turn out to be the uh, Georgia job? I think that's a pretty interesting as I said before, it probably doesn't matter all that much one way or another, but you know, how many years prior to taking the Georgia do job did Smart have his eyes on UGA and what was going on there? Or vice versa. You know, I mean, yeah. I, I mean, sometimes you figure that, you know, the next guy is, you know, kind of set up. It wouldn't be the first time. I mean, I think everybody assumed Will Muschamp was going to be the next coach at Texas at one time, right? Um, so, you know, there, there's something to that, and, and I thought the same thing be. I thought, well, that's really interesting. You know, Sam told his wife that Kirby's going to be the coach at Georgia one day, and if he gets it, I'm going to listen. You know, I thought that was pretty because that would have been after the 2014 game. 
Um, but yeah, I mean, well, I, 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 you can see why. Let me call time out for one second. You said it had been after the 2014 game, but if I'm doing the math correctly, it would have been after the 2013 game, wouldn't it? Because he said it was two years prior to Smart uh-huh. taking the job, and he took the job in 2015. So if they're having that conversation in 2013, once again, it doesn't really matter all that much, but it's just kind of interesting. If they're having that conversation in 2013, that's the year after that Georgia had gone down to the wire with Alabama, almost won the SEC, and it probably would have also led to a national championship given the fact that Notre Dame was the BCS title game opponent that year. So if they are having this conversation in 2013 – I mean, at the time, Mark Rick was still standing on pretty firm ground at Georgia, having just had what was arguably one of his three best teams at UGA the year before. Yeah, I, that, it, it, it's speculative, 2013, 2014. Hard to know. You know, Sam might have been generalizing. Sure. Uh, but regardless, the, the fact that Kirby told him after the game, you know, and then Sam said, you know, I thought about writing right him a note, but, but I didn't. I just kept working hard. And the fact that Kirby remembered, and it just goes to show you the respect. And then the flip side, Brandon, the other thing about it that I thought was really cool was when Sam left. Um, yeah, he probably could have tried to take one or two guys with him and might have even had some set, some success. You know, when Lane Kiffin left Tennessee, Ed Orgeron was on that Tennessee staff, and he told players not to go to class because if they go to class and get enrolled, that they couldn't decommit. So that Lane Kiffin staff and Ed Ordron, they they tried to recruit players from Tennessee when Lane left there, um, which was that, that's not that's not cool, right? right. But it's real. It, it happens. You see coaches leave all the time, and they try to take players with them. But Sam, Sam actually told Tate Rattler, you know, you, you committed to Georgia. Let's not be talking about changing where you're going. And yeah. he tried to help Kirby firm up the class. And I'll tell you, that is just that's just the right thing to do. It's 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 not an easy thing to do if you're Sam because you know he needed players. But it's the right thing to do, and it just lets everybody know uh, what a great guy Sam is, and I think that's why everybody hopes he has great success at at Arkansas. So uh, Monday night, a really fun interview with Ben Cleveland, former Georgia offensive lineman, a guy that obviously worked with Pittman very closely during his time there at UGA. You know, Cleveland is a a pretty cool dude all the way around. I'd say he's a very interesting fella, going back to his time even as a recruit, obviously, uh, during his time at UGA there as well. How did you find your conversation with uh, Cleveland also this week? Yeah, you know, Ben is a good guy. You know, you're right. And, and you know, he had a long career at Georgia. You think about it, he was a redshirt senior and, uh, you know, overcame that broken leg and, you know, kind of in the lineup. I had some good competition in the lineup with Cade Mays for playing time. A guy that never complained, uh, a guy that never had a bad word to say. You know, I think about it, and it seems like Kirby would send Ben Cleveland out for interviews when things were tough, when times were tough, because he knew that Ben Cleveland was kind of a calming force and, and I think he was a unifier. I think he was a glue guy. If I'm an NFL team, I look at Ben and I go, okay, this guy's 6'5", 350. He's powerful. He loves the games. It's somebody I can work with. But beyond that, just get the sense that he's a great locker room presence. And he brings a steadiness. You know, I asked Ben last night about Isaiah Wilson. And, and, I, and I didn't tell Ben I was going to ask him. I kind of sprung it on him. And the way he answered it was just so mature, Brandon. You know, about, you know, I think he's a good player and I think that he'll go somewhere where he might be able to find the right kind of help. And, and you know, and just it was just a very mature, sensitive uh, answer. Uh, you could tell that Ben cared about Isaiah. And he just said, man, this, this, this guy's special. You know, I, I, wherever he ends up, hopefully he gets a great NFL career. And then hopefully after that we get to see him in the ring for a few years because I think he would be phenomenal on the microphone and in the WWE contest. Sure. He is so much fun. Oh, I'd love to see that. You know, imagine how proud that'd make me if one of these Georgia guys went on to a fame on SmackDown or Monday Night Raw or something like that. I'd be thrilled about that all the way around. By the way, we should point out that Isaiah Wilson was traded yesterday from the Tennessee Titans to the Miami Dolphins, so a fresh start for Wilson uh, in a new home and hopefully a chance to move on from what right now looks like one of the worst first-round picks in certainly recent NFL draft history, if not all time. So best of luck to Isaiah Wilson. Change of scenery hopefully helps him out there as he tries to reboot his NFL career. Mike, in the time we have left, I want to talk a little bit about the uh, big news that I don't know that it's news, but it's only been a hot topic. That's probably the better way to describe this. The audio recordings that Rush Probst did not know he's being recorded. Of course, the embattled Valdosta high school coach uh, talking about wild accusations against Alabama and most prominently for our show against Georgia for, you know, how these programs, as Probst tells it, go about their recruiting business and huge sums of money they throw around to these players. Mike, I said this on yesterday's show that, listen, I've lived in the deep south my entire life. 
to my mind, this is just how people talk. They love showing off how much they are in the know. They love, you know, embellishing these tales, and they keep getting bigger and bigger and bigger as time goes on. We kind of laughed about this when it first came out. Uh, I feel like we're uh, validated in kind of treating this as kind of a joke. Uh, obviously, rival Georgia fans want this to be true so bad. But given the tweet from Nick Chubb, given the kind of the shrug from Hugh Nall, given you know the AJC report about you know what the other half of this uh, telephone conversation was saying, my guess is, Mike, we don't hear much more about this. And by the way, for the people who are not Georgia fans, and then after that I promise I'll let you talk, but um, who are thinking that I'm just saying this because this is Georgia, when the McDonald's stuff came out about Tennessee, we laughed about that too. We also said this probably isn't true either. So we've been fairly consistent on some of these tall tales related to recruiting annex and things like that. But in this particular case, my guess is we're just about done with, you know, Rush Probes and his accusations against Georgia. I don't think we hear much more about that. What do you think? Yeah, it's a lot of speculation. And, you know, the difference with Tennessee was their own chancellor came out and said she was shocked at all the allegations, right? It was verified by the school that had done an investigation. And whether there was McDonald's bags or not, I, I, I don't know the answer to that. But but the thing is, is Dan Patrick was a credible source. and 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 he said it and so therefore you know but this is a guy that didn't say it in a public forum right this is a guy like you said he's just he's just talking he's just talking to somebody in the back he's not he doesn't even know he's on the record and you know to throw names around to me the, the accusations really weren't against kirby he was saying that there were boosters doing stuff that kirby knew well i don't know i mean kirby does talk to boosters that's his job you think the most powerful people, the richest people in Bainbridge want to talk to Kirby Smart? Uh, yeah, he's from there. Do you think that they want to give donations to the University of Georgia? Probably. You know, the, yeah, of course. That, that just makes sense. So, you know, but it's, it, it, the, the concept that, that Kirby Smart's running around handing out cash is ridiculous. I mean, same thing with Saban. We've been hearing, oh, Nick Saban does this since Julio Jones. There have been rumors and talks, like you said, Brandon. People like to speculate. I said you could go into any bar in the South. And people are going to be telling stories that they heard this and their uncle this and their aunt that. And I've covered college football enough to know about stories that, that have happened, you know, that, that, that weren't able to be proven. So, you know, do some college players get paid? Probably. Probably. You're being honest about it? I say, eh, probably some people get Do I know where? No, I don't. I can't tell you anybody in Georgia. I don't know first. I don't know anybody in Georgia. I don't know anybody in Alabama. Do I think it's probably happening? Yeah. Do, do I think you can prove it? Good luck. You know, I mean, heck, look at this. The FBI had these people on the phone, tapped phone calls, and the LSU coach is still there. So you not only do you got to prove it, but somehow you got to get these guys fired, or there's got to be penalties. Now, when the school does their own investigation, like Tennessee, and they tell you, yeah, we, yeah, this was shocking. We couldn't believe it. And they fired 10 people. Yeah, that that's pretty real. That's different. Than, than a, a disgraced high school coach, it, which, by the way, Brandon, and I, this is, I say this at every turn, and I'm just amazed that the, the part of the story that's not getting talked about, the real, the real meat on the bone here is the self-admission of guilt from Russ when he was the Hoover coach, when he says when he was at Hoover that the Hoover Police Department would take money that was seized in drug raids and use it as a slush fund to help them recruit players to Hoover. That is an admission of guilt. Yeah, but that I don't believe that either. But, Mike, I don't believe that either. I mean, like, like that why, to me. Why would he lie? Because I think he's trying to get something from Valdosta. I think he's trying to tell these stories to see what he can get down there in Valdosta. So, like, all of this sounds like this is how much of a big shot I am. This is how much I know. And you, you're, you're right. Why would he incriminate himself? I think he just wants to see what he can get out of. I mean, frankly, even the stuff that he says to incriminate himself, I, I have a, a suspicion that even that's not true. <laughs> well, you may have a good point there, Brandon. I guarantee you the Hoover Police Department was going through their bookkeeping and interviewing people, and uh, so was the mayor. He claimed that the mayor chipped in. But you're right. It did sound like he was trying to coax Val Dodson into doing more like, this is how good I had it back in Hoover. Yeah. And the guy goes, well, you can just, didn't he just say at one point, well, you can just ask me for money or something like that. It was just, it just made you roll your eyes and go, oh, my goodness. I think Bugs Bunny would say, what a maroon, right? Right, I mean, right. The, the guy that he was talking to just seemed like, you know, hello, you know. But it, it's, it's, 
it is what it is. You know, the, 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 the ridiculous of itness of it is, is what people, but to your point, I think you made a really good point on your show yesterday and, and I liked your headline. A lot of people want to believe it's true. Not just in the SEC, but in the Big Ten. Everywhere else, if it can't be Georgia, they can't be Alabama, they can't be LSU, oh, well then they must be doing something wrong. It can't just be that they're better than us. Well, I'll tell you, I'll tell you the real numbers they need to look at. You can look right there in the Georgia budget and you can see that Georgia spends more money on recruiting than any program in the country. And, and even though I don't necessarily agree with your premise on this, uh, you can look at how much money they spend in facilities and you can see how committed they are. And if they're going to spend that much on recruiting budget and they're going to spend that much on facilities and they're going to spend that much on coaches, that tells you how committed that program is to winning championships and developing players. And they put 10 guys at the combine. That's why they're going to Georgia. That's why they're going to Alabama. Yeah, I think it's exactly right. Georgia's essentially recruiting right now the way they always should have been. And I think that's one of the things that makes other SEC fans a little nervous is the fact that this, you know, powerful state, you know, uh, compares to other Southeast states, uh, wealthy state, big population, UGA as an academic institution kind of on the rise. All of a sudden, all the uh, folks are kind of swimming in the same direction here. I think that creates a real momentum for UGA that I think makes other Southern Southern schools or SEC schools a little nervous. In fact, we'll finish with this. Mike, the source that I initially heard this audio from was uh, an SEC podcast on Twitter, and they had both clips, right? You know, Probst talking about Saban, Probst talking about Kirby. I thought this was really fascinating that by almost any estimation, Saban's a bigger sports figure than Kirby Smart is, more well-known by casual fans, you know, just a bigger celebrity, if you want to use that word. Yet the allegation recording of Probst on Georgia had four times as many views or listens as the allegation against Kirby uh, against Nick Saban, which to me is fascinating here that it's almost like if you're a Tennessee fan or an Auburn fan, I would take this to mean that those fans kind of take getting beaten up on by Alabama as a little more tolerable than getting beaten up on by Georgia for whatever reason that is. It's like the idea that that Rush Probst may have had some dirt on Kirby Smart was more exciting to the average SEC fan than the notion that he may have had some dirt on Nick Saban. Now, that to me is interesting, even though the claims, I believe, are all false. (laughs) Well, I also think the Alabama fans have been hearing about how they've been cheap for so long. They go, ah, it's just another one. We ain't bothering them. They've been saying Saban for years. You know, the Alabama fans, they know how to handle it. They just flush it. They go ahead. Nothing's going to stick to me. You know, they, but, but Georgie really, you know, they really hasn't had, you know, George Kirby really hasn't had anything run afoul, or you really haven't heard those allegations. You know, oh, I suspect this, I suspect that. But, you know, Dan Patrick said he heard the NCAA was sniffing around. And people are like, what, what, where? You know, and we wrote a story. Uh, Josh Brooks commented to Dog Nation, said, no, it's nothing to it. We're looking at it. We're looking into it. We have nothing, you know, has anything to do like this, you know. So that, but that's a different out. That's an allegation from a, a person with, with credibility. It's Dan Patrick, right? That's somebody in the media on the national television. You know, Rush Rush Props, though. I mean, like this guy. I mean, you know, show you his driver's license. I still don't know if I'd cash the check, right? I mean, you, you look at the background and just man, the credibility factor, and and people know. I mean, dog, we didn't write anything till Nick when Nick Chubb comments. Okay, now there's somebody credible commenting on this, right? But before it's just you know, like you said, it's just. You know, a bunch of you know, flies circling around a dead carcass. I mean, I, I, don't know. I don't know. It just didn't seem like much to me. Well, uh, Mike, appreciate you being here on the show. I know you got a lot of great stuff coming up at DogNation.com over the course of the next couple of days. Can't wait to read all of that. We're very, very close to the start of spring practice. That's really fun and exciting. So uh, we'll have a lot to chat about as the uh, weeks roll on here. So thanks for being here on a little bit of a different day for you here on a Tuesday. But fun conversation nonetheless. We'll look forward to speaking to you soon. Thanks, V.A. Have a great one. Let's take a look around the rest of the league. This is SEC Through. One important thing I want to say about what Mike just said there, and I don't want to get too deep in the weeds about semantics, what words mean, things like that, but I do think it's important. Mike calls Dan Patrick a credible source related to what Patrick had said about Tennessee, what Patrick had said about Georgia, about the the word that was used was Georgia had, quote, gotten sloppy in recruiting. Dan Patrick is a very famous name. Almost everybody knows who he is if you're a fairly big sports fan, so... When Patrick made the claim about Tennessee, made the claim about Georgia, um, that's going to get some attention. But that attention from a celebrity voice does not equate to credibility. And I think this is important to note because there are some people, in fact, I've heard this around the SEC within the last couple of days of, well, you just add what Rush Probe says to what Dan Patrick said on the radio not too long ago. Folks, 
so much of what Dan Patrick has discussed has been completely laughed off the stage as untrue before it could have you know, ever even had a chance to get legs. Not just the Georgia stuff related to the NCAA. Remember, Dan Patrick also looked into a microphone very similar to the one that I'm speaking into right now and told his audience that Jason Witten was a candidate to be the next coach of the Tennessee Vols. So, I mean, Dan Patrick has been just, you know, grasping at straws related to all of this for a while. I mean, yes, Tennessee has acknowledged some NCAA impropriety, but, you know, the whole idea that, that Patrick pushed the McDonald's thing, you're not going to find very many people who, who think it's serious that recruits were going into a McDonald's drive through and coming out with a bag full of cash, even though we have the, the bag on our desk here as a way of having fun with that. I mean, serious people, for the most part, laugh that off. Patrick got plenty wrong when it came to the Big Ten and the return to play stuff. He was he was not well informed on all of that, even though sources supposedly said. So it's really important to know here. When Dan Patrick said what he said, we obviously covered on the show because we're in the entertainment business and Patrick's a well-known name. When he says that kind of stuff, we're obviously going to talk about that. But as far as Dan Patrick being a credible news you know, source at this point in time in his career, I think the proof is in the pudding on that. And so much of what Patrick has run with on his radio show has turned out to be easily falsifiable. So keep that in mind. Before we roll through our SEC through, let me remind you that on video every single day when our show is done, we do the RS Andrews Cooldown. The RS and RS Andrews name stands for rapid service. That means they show up quickly to do big time work on your air conditioning units, your heating units electrical issues, plumbing issues, they can take care of all of that. Of course, we are just on the verge of the start of the spring season. That means air conditioning's working on overdrive in the very hot climate we live here down in the state of Georgia. If you're concerned that your system may not be ready to go, get the peace of mind you need by getting it tuned back up to factory fresh specs. RS Andrews can take care of that for you online at rsandrews.com. All right, let's roll through a few SEC through stories here for a moment. I thought it was interesting that Cody Brown, you may remember him as a four-star running back in the class of 2021 at a Parkview High School, signed with Tennessee, decided he wanted to leave Tennessee. He was easily granted his uh, release from his letter of intent, something that Dylan Brooks and others kind of had to fight their way for to actually get. But Brown has announced a new home. He is going to Miami. I do think Miami is a pretty interesting program at the moment. And, you know, people think about Manny Diaz as the coach there and kind of what they've done on the defensive side of the ball. But Rhett Lashley is offensive coordinator. Lashley had a really good year for Miami a year ago. And a lot of that was on the ground. It was, you know, based on running the football. All of a sudden now, you give another weapon to run the football there. I think Miami as a little bit of a team on the somewhat rise, especially with Derek King coming back for what seems like his 50th year in college football. I think that Miami is a team worth watching in the ACC just a little bit with Cody Brown leaving Tennessee to go there. And I think a lot of us are curious. You know, last year there was Notre Dame in the ACC, so you had someone other than Clemson. With UNC looking pretty good on paper, they'll be in some preseason top tens. Miami doing better in recruiting. How much of a of a substance beyond Clemson is there in the ACC this season? Over the course of the next couple of years, that should be an interesting thing to watch, and Cody Brown could contribute to some of that for Miami. Uh, it came to a head for Les Miles yesterday. He was removed as coach at Kansas. The statement from Kansas referenced only the losses that he's had there with the Jayhawks, the need to win games moving forward, did not reference the allegations that he had at LSU. Some people kind of took that as a, as a slight to what maybe had gone on, and, of course, you can read all about the accusations of improper con- conduct by Miles, improper contact with female employees there at LSU. Some people had a problem with that. Either way, Les Miles is now out at Kansas, and uh, that program now looking for head coach. They've been a disaster, obviously, on the field. Miles a disaster right now off the field, and so that became an untenable relationship. And this may be about the last we ever hear from Les Miles in kind of a big-time college football situation. You know, based on the stuff that's out there with him at LSU, he is essentially persona non grata now. So the Miles era in college football now officially appears to be over. And then finally, there's this. Mike Eckler, the uh, you know new Tennessee assistant special teams coach there, was asked about his time at UGA uh, when he was doing a press conference there with the Vols. Obviously, the rumors were that he and uh, Jeremy Pruitt had gotten, gotten into a physical confrontation. And asked about that directly, Eckler essentially sidestepped the question, would not – say that he didn't certainly which led some people to wonder if he did that time at georgia i guess would have been what the 2015 season what a fascinating time that was uh with with pruitt on the staff 
and uh, the the anger that seemed to engender on the part of a lot of people who worked here. And there's been some reporting on there, well, even in the annals, you know, the deep archives of Dog Nation. You can go back and read some of that kind of stuff. But uh, Eckler having a chance to answer that directly yesterday kind of sidestepped that all the way around. Uh, pretty interesting stuff for the new special teams coach at Tennessee, former assistant here at Georgia. We'll make that your SEC through. All right, so a funny edition of our Gator Hater Roll Call, which is our Golden Shoe Award winner today. However, today's Golden Shoe is not related to uh, Florida. It's more related to situation that's been the news the last day or so. This is pretty funny. Let me show you Matt here on Twitter. We talked yesterday about Rush Probst, the Valdosta coach, in the recorded conversation, making an allegation against Georgia. He called Nick Chubb Nick Chubbs, which is, I've said before, it's weird how some people have a tendency to put S's on the name of athletes that don't need that S. Chubb being an example of this. Well, Matt let me know on Twitter that he actually maybe wasn't talking about Nick Chubb. He was talking about Chubbs, the uh, golf pro from the movie Happy Gilmore, for those of you that remember that Carl Weathers in that role there so pretty funny stuff from Matt Matt that's certainly worthy of winning a golden shoe congratulations to you for that how about those lousy stinking Gators Gator Hater Countdown Georgia goes back to Jacksonville 235 days from now we'll see you tomorrow on Dog Nation Daily presented by ESOG and on video time now for our R.S. Andrews cool down as I was telling you before air conditioning heating plumbing and electric you can trust R.S. Andrews to do all of that for you They'll show up on time. They'll do the work that's promised for the price that's promised. One of the reasons why we love recommending our friends at R.S. Andrews. This seemed to work pretty well yesterday. Um, and I think that we will uh, certainly have a good time doing that here today on the phone here. So let me uh, pull up some Facebook comments. We'll rock and roll on these. And then we will uh, take some YouTube comments. And we'll let you guys bounce out of here. Hope all of you are doing well. Curious to see what you guys have going on. What you're thinking about everything that's out here. Um, or let's hear. Daryl Tony says, I wonder if Cade Mays regrets going to Tennessee. It's certainly probably not the version of the Vols program that he thought he was going to when he arrived there. Probably, probably not. Joseph Kennedy on the subject of Les Miles. Yeah, kind of a rough end for Miles there as far as a big time college football figure. Uh, for sure on that. Let's see what else is going on. Neil Calvino says, tell them you like us better. Obviously, over here on the Facebook side, that battle goes back and forth. It's good to have all of you here. Lindsey Hardiman says, can't wait to beat those lousy, stinking gators. You and me both, Lindsey, can't wait for that there as well. Donnie Penton says, where do we stand with the Clemson cornerback right now? My guess is that George is certainly interested. I mean, there's enough you know, kind of whispers and chatter out there to suggest they might be. Georgia's obviously, when it comes to a player like this who's started a program like Clemson, the guess is that Georgia's probably not the only program that's interested here. So um, so my guess is we'll hear very little about this up until the moment that, that Kendrick ar- arrives on campus somewhere, I'm guessing. I mean, right now you don't have that freedom to take those visits the way that you would in kind of a non-pandemic time. We are still, after all, in all of that. So uh, my guess is we'll hear very little about this until – until he makes his decision one way or another, but I'm assuming that George is involved here. Keith Fold says, are we doing a thing at Callaway Gardens this year? Boy, I sure would love to do that. Great time last, oh, was it two summers ago now for a Dog Nation Days of Summer. Hopefully we can get back to doing those kinds of things again very soon. I'd love to be able to. Love to be able to. <laughs> Orin, <laughs> Orin Chili said... <laughs> Very funny and shouting out one of our sponsors here. Uh, pretty good stuff from Oren there. I like that. Um, Lindsey Hardiman says, I also can't wait to see what the offense is going to do this season. High expectations. Yeah, I'm the same way. I'm fascinated by it. And I'm really hopeful that spring football gives us a little bit of a glimpse into some of that. I think that, I think that can be a great chance. Hopefully G-Day gives you a chance to see what Georgia really might look like. I think that's, I think that's all a really fun conversation. Uh, Junior Baker, good to see him checking in. Uh, talking about Bronson, the running back out of uh, Mississippi. Did Jeff talk about him when he was with us the other day here on the uh, show? Uh, Junior, I'll have to go back and listen to that to see. But uh, obviously, uh, it's good to see you uh, checking back into the conversation here. Adam Doby says, uh, Les Miles, Bobby Petrino. Yeah, certainly similar, maybe, feelings about both those coaches right now. Obviously, Jeff Long, the 
the Kansas athletic director has already hired Bobby Petrino once at Arkansas. Maybe he brings him back again the second time. Obviously, I'm joking about that. Kevin Cook says, will the media be able to watch spring practice and give us updates? No, my my guess is is that, and I'm only guessing, obviously I would hope this would not be true, but my, my guess is there's still no media access for spring practice if I had to guess. It'd be cool if there was, but um, but my guess is there probably won't be. Probably won't be that. So we'll have to try to unearth some of that stuff from Georgia players during those interviews, but I think we're still kind of in that in that world for all of this. I mean, part of me also kind of, this is an inside thing. You don't care about media stuff. But I, I I personally think that you get more from players when you interview them face-to-face, that when you're interviewing the players via Zoom, some of the times you can kind of get something out of players based on body language, especially for like a thing where you're doing video or something like that, which is a little bit more of what I would do when I was there. And I think that distance that's created by the video teleconference stuff I just think makes it hard to make that connection with the player. Sometimes if you kind of, you know, shake your head, nod up and down and, you know, kind of affirm what they're saying, they'll keep talking and say more because they start to feel more comfortable. You can use your body language to make them feel more comfortable. And in a Zoom world, you can't really do that. And so they're just staring, you know, straight ahead like I'm staring, talking to you, which I do this for a living. So I'm used to it if, you know, they're doing this, you know, without really thinking much about it, they're not used to that. And so therefore I think you get a little stiffer version of the players during the zoom interviews. Not, that's not a criticism of them. They don't communicate for a living. That's just, they're just doing what they're being asked to do. The point here is, is in addition to, you know, getting a chance to watch a little bit of practice, I think that sometimes we actually learn more from the players when you get a chance to interview them in person. And, you know, based on what happened The other day with the Zoom interviews continuing for right now, my guess is those are also continuing there on the video teleconference there as well. Tennille Calvino says, can't wait for another Dog Nation get-together. Yeah, me too, Tennille. I'm hoping we're able to do that here pretty soon. Uh, Now, whatever pretty soon is, is, I guess, open for interpretation, but I certainly would like to be able to do that. Um, Thomas Tyson says, the probes Chubb story isn't true, but y'all are acting like he would be of bad character if he did receive money. I think that Thomas, all people are really doing is just kind of protecting their program there on on anything related to that. As far as like, you know, what someone like Chubb would be thinking or doing if he took that money. I mean, listen, uh, I won't even, you know, kind of speculate about what his thought process may be related to that. But it sounds like according to Nick Chubb, he was already feeling, you know, well taken care of as it was. He says he didn't even need that. Frank Patterson says, if Zeus goes over 100 yards, I get to be your guest in the postgame show in Charlotte. That's a fun thing to think about, Frank. That's a fun thing to think about. Um, Foster Moss says, Miami's on its way back, LOL. Maybe so. Whatever happened to our buddy Dennis? Dennis, our YouTube uh, Miami fan. We haven't seen Dennis in a while, have we? Maybe he uh, found another uh, show to go troll, but he was never a bad guy. He was never a bad guy. Noah Sheldon says, will G-Day be on television? Almost certainly it will be. Um, because even like say Florida, who's not having a spring game, I think they're still having a TV event around that. So at the very least, all this stuff will be televised in the SEC network. So there will be some television coverage for G day. And for a lot of people, that'll be your only access to that because tickets are going to be once again, limited for all of this. Noah Sheldon mentioning, uh, Bronson Robinson, who came up before cool name for running back. Yeah, it really is. Um, Nick Duke says, I listen to the podcast every day, but this is my first time watching live in about a year. Nick, thank you for being here. I really appreciate that. It's nice to have you checking in. I, I do think we have plans for a podcast cool down that's going to start soon. So if you enjoy this kind of stuff, I think I have a way for us to kind of do that via podcast there as well. I'm looking forward to rolling that out. Christy says, please better watch out when reporting fake news about uh, Nick Chubb, so uh, Christy coming out swinging here today. That's good to see. Jay Shipe says Facebook again. Come on, Jay. Come on, Jay. Mark Woodman C says, until someone shows me a money trail or people trails, it's just gossip. Just saying, show me the facts. Yeah, I mean, Mark, what, what Probe said, I mean, I think he probably believes himself. I don't think Probe thinks he's lying on this, but what I think people and you know those of us who've kind of been around this kind of stuff for a while understand that 
while Probst may think he's telling the God's honest truth, what he's really doing is telling a story that someone told him. And it's a game of telephone after a while. We've seen a million examples of this. Hey, let me tell you, because I heard from somebody who knows. But that person that supposedly knows, all he did was hear some story from somebody else. I mean, it is, as I said before, there's no better description of this than just a game of telephone that kind of turns into its own version of Mad Lib. X player got blah, blah, blah for doing blah, blah, blah. And, you know, on and on and on it goes. You know, this kind of stuff just sort of lives you know, in the atmosphere. And it's one of the reasons why programs like Georgia have to be so careful. I mean, that was always the, the funniest thing to me about the description that Dan Patrick gave of somehow Georgia got sloppy. I mean, look around the Georgia program right now. What is sloppy about this program whatsoever? You know, the whole notion of th- th- that somehow Georgia's not going to be completely buttoned up and, you know, dotting its I's, crossing its T's, when that's kind of the, the mentality Georgia takes towards anything. And as you've heard me say before, how you do anything is how you do everything. And uh, that's just it. I mean, that's just kind of the way that goes. So, um, so yeah, I mean, I think that I think that's you know kind of that's just kind of that. All right, let's see what else. A couple more, we're gonna get ready to get out of here. <laughs> Jay Shipe's funny, and looking at the uh, comparison between LSU and Florida. Ace Dog checking out. Thanks for being here. Noah Sheldon calling for a big score against Tennessee. That'd be fun to see. Frank Patterson says, you guys see the Tennessee baseball team celebrating with the McDonald's bags of the day? Yeah, I did see that. We briefly talked about that on the show. I find that to be pretty funny. I find that to be pretty funny. West Georgia Dog fan also bringing up one of our sponsors related to some of the stuff that's uh, going on. All I'll say is there are some people within the uh, world of football that could certainly keep them very busy. That's all I'll say about that. Jay Shipes also... A lot of funny stuff from Jay Shipes today and here today. Uh, Keith Simmons says, I wouldn't draft Pitts number six in the draft. To go back to uh, what we were saying about uh, Kyle Pitts a little earlier, I actually kind of agree with that. I mean, I think that Kyle Pitts is a really good player. I don't know that I would take him number six overall, although I do clearly see the value in big-time tight ends. I, I definitely I definitely see that. Keith Lamb says, how do you think the defense will do in 2021? They have a lot of turnover in a young secondary. So to me, this is one of the bigger stories for Georgia this upcoming spring. Although sometimes when it comes to G-Day, I think you're able to tell a little less about the defense than you do the offense because a lot of times these spring scrimmages are just designed to make the offense hopefully look better. But what you have for Georgia is a secondary that's going to probably be a little less than we've kind of come to expect Georgia secondaries being. It's certainly less in the way of experience. Talent's still pretty good. I mean, more than pretty good. It's fantastic. But obviously, experience matters there. So my guess is the Georgia secondary is going to have its moments of showing some growing pains, maybe the occasional struggle here and there. So the question really comes down to, can you be good enough in the front seven to mitigate against that? That's we, we talked about Nolan Smith before on the show. We've talked about, obviously, what I think is the strength of this team along the defensive line. If you can be as good as I think Georgia can be with its front seven, all of a sudden, whatever you may be related to the to the uh, secondary, all of a sudden it just matters a little less. All of a sudden, you know, your chance of being, um, you know, your chance of being as good as you want to be, championship level good, all of a sudden that becomes way easier. So the so the issue for Georgia defensively is what it does along the front seven to help take some pressure off that secondary you know, once these games start getting played, hopefully get a chance to see that coming up here this spring. So with that said, we're going to get ready to wrap up our R.S. Andrews cool down for today. Appreciate all of you being with us. Uh, Make sure you check out R.S. Andrews online at rsandrews.com. Also, make sure you check out the AJC for Atlanta News Now at ajc.com. Really good chance for you to stay up to date on all the big news that are going on around the, uh, around our city. For those of you that live in the Atlanta area, very important thing to be able to do. Um, School safety with the coronavirus, it's continuing to be a hot topic, big uh, investigation going on with that, really fun video event taking place from the AJC that's going to look a little bit more closely into that. You can see that coming up, AJC.com, for more details on that. Um, 
Also, expanded seating capacity coming up for the Atlanta Hawks here in the second half of the NBA season. We've said before, professional sports, certainly baseball heading towards the summer because it's outdoors. You know, some of the stuff with the winter sports like the NBA, a little bit of a precursor to what college football is also going to do with its own scheduling stuff. You got to have somebody kind of help lead the way for you to be able to expand seating to the degree that college football probably wants to. So that's an important thing worth watching. You can pick up on all of that big news. Also, not too early to start thinking about some fun St. Patrick's Day events around the uh, city of Atlanta there as well. So Atlanta News Now, all of that, AJC.com. Make sure you check that out. Thanks for being here on the R.S. Andrews Cooldown here today. Find them online at rsandrews.com for your air conditioning, heating, plumbing, and electric needs. They'll show up on time. They'll do the work that's promised, the price that's promised. Make sure you check out R.S. Andrews today. You'll have a great day. I'll look forward to seeing you back here again tomorrow morning, 10 a.m., for Dog Nation Daily, presented by Engineered Solutions of Georgia. I look forward to talking to you then, everybody.